Welcome back to Story Mode. It's 1996 and I've tried all sorts of jobs, but with the love of video games running through my veins, I needed to get back into the industry. That's the sound of 1986, and here are a few more to take you back to that time. You touch my hand. Some awesome songs from 1986, but let's look at my favourite. Yep, I am not embarrassed to admit it. I absolutely loved the Spice Girls. I would listen to their music all the time, non-stop, all the CDs. I just loved them. Now, over the years, you've seen my eclectic taste in music. But in 1996, I found my favourite musician of all time, to this very day. And that is the amazing Jamiroquai. I have every single record, every single CD. I've gone to so many concerts and I just love JK. She's just a cosmic girl. From 1996 to this very day, I have not stopped loving this guy. And if I had to meet anyone in the world in person, this guy would be at the top of my list. And now to look at some of the movies I was watching in 1996. Mars Attacks, Scream, Independence Day, The Cable Guy, Happy Gilmore, From Dust Till Dawn, but my favourite probably goes to Jerry Maguire. Me help you. Help me help you. So I'm having a time of my life with my new computer, my Pentium Pro, with my CD writer. But I needed to get income and fast. So I decided to contact the video game wholesaler in Hong Kong, the exact same one I used when I had my shop. They were so happy to hear from me. They thought I was actually ringing up to buy more PlayStation 1 and Sega Saturn games from them in wholesale lots because Saturn and PlayStation were doing quite well at the time and with the new arrival of the Ultra 64, they thought maybe I'd start up a video game shop again. I explained I couldn't buy in bulk as money's a little bit tight at the moment, but I would like to buy some Sega Saturn and maybe a couple of PlayStation 1 games. I also asked them about mod chips for the Sega Saturn and the PlayStation 1. This allows you to play burnt games on the respective consoles. They said they had thousands of PlayStation 1 mod chips in stock and the only thing they had for the Sega Saturn was this cartridge called the Magic Card V2 that you would put in the cartridge side of the Saturn and it allows you to play burnt games. There were other ways around it as well. I jumped at the chance and ordered 50 mod chips because if I ordered over 50, they would do a much better price. I can't remember exactly but I think I was paying between $40 and $45 per mod chip. And at the time, mod chips were brand new. Hardly anyone was modding PlayStations, especially in Australia. So typically I put an ad in the paper and then all of a sudden, I was modding around 20 PlayStations a week. And then within a few weeks, I was modding 20 PlayStations a night. Yep, it got out of control. And even people selling burnt games in the local paper who were modding PlayStations, they had no time to mod. They just wanted to burn games all day. So they would send me their PlayStations and then literally I'd be modding around 80 PlayStation 1s a day. Now Saturn mod chips did come out and they were a lot simpler to install, but Sega Saturn wasn't doing too well at the time. At the start, it was kind of comparable to PlayStation 1, especially in Japan. But I just didn't have the customer base to mod Saturns. I don't know how many I had, probably say 80 PlayStations a day, 
compared to maybe five or 10 satins a week. So it wasn't too great. The months rolled by and then all of a sudden other people were modding PlayStations. And then I noticed that it have to start being competitive. I can't remember what I charged at the start. It might have been about $120, $130. And then everyone else would charge $120 and everyone was undercutting. So I had to start buying mods in bulk to get the chip price down. And then maybe I could make a little bit here and there. It was insane. The money I was making on mod chips was crazy. The thing is, I was also selling a thing called Silvers. And that is basically copy games on the PlayStation 1 or Sega Saturn, but they were pressed, not burnt. And they were from Hong Kong, and that was a that was a little bit illegal, I will say. So it was around early May 1996, and the company asked me if I wanted to buy the Nintendo 64. It finally had its name, its prototype name, was the Ultra 64, it now had its actual name, Nintendo 64, and I would read about it in magazines, and I was very, very excited to get one for myself at least. But I decided to try my hand at maybe selling Nintendo 64s here in Australia, like bringing them in from Hong Kong, and obviously they will be brought in from Japan. I put an ad in the paper, and I thought the mod chips were crazy. This was insane. Within two days, I had 50 pre-orders of the consoles. And this would only help me get my one cheaper because just like anything, the more you buy off a wholesaler, the cheaper it gets. And I will be selling these N64s for around $600. I can't remember how much I bought them for. I didn't make a lot on them. Uh, they were just very expensive to buy at the start, obviously supply and demand. The great thing was the company said if I put my order in now, I could have it on the 24th of June. That's one day after it came out in Japan. So I would have it at my front door on the 24th of June and I just couldn't say no. I ordered 50 units straight off or 51, I can't remember exactly, but I remember ordering the quantity I sold plus an extra one for myself. So I registered the business name Australian Vision Games once again. The only difference is I didn't have a storefront. I was doing it all from home. My mum was pretty good considering maybe 10 to 15 people a day would come to the house and buy games or get their PlayStation modded or the Sega Saturn modded or put deposit down for the incredible N64. I don't know how she put up with it to be honest, but I thought you never know, maybe my luck will change one day and I can open up a shop again. So as the weeks roll by and we're getting closer to the date where the Nintendo 64 is officially released in Japan, I had at least another 100 pre-orders from all over Australia. It's me, Mario! So the day finally come and it was there on the 24th of June. I think they sent it on the 21st. It takes a few days to get here from Hong Kong and the delivery was massive. You know, there was about, from memory, I think I ordered 170 all up. I had a few extras in case. 170 N64s, and it was unbelievable. I had to pay a lot of import duty and tax on them, but that was um, reflective to the price of what people were paying. I kind of knew that ahead. And it was unbelievable. It was such a great time to have people come to my house, pick up their N64s, and seeing their face knowing that they are one of the first people on the planet to get an N64, of course, apart from Japan. A huge memory for me is taking my N64 to Kylie's place and playing it with her little brother. He was like the little brother I never had. It was so much fun to play games with him. His name was Ashley. He would have been around nine or 10 years old at the time. And I bet he didn't even know what he had in front of him. He would be one of the only kids in the whole Australia to play a Nintendo 64 that early. The other thing I'd do is make deliveries. I would drive around Melbourne and deliver consoles or do mod chips on the spot sometimes. That was very rare because I didn't like doing it in front of people. Kind of feel a little bit of pressure. Obviously selling games. I never did burn games. I did for myself. I didn't want to sell burned games just in case you never know. But it was an amazing time and within, I don't know, three months, I would have on my books over 700 regular customers. So one day a good family friend came over. His name is Tim Ferguson. He is a celebrity. 
He's been on shows like Don't Forget Your Toothbrush and the Doug Anthony All-Stars. Just because two days ago we pissed into his milk bottles. <laughs> it's not that he doesn't like the taste, it's just it keeps changing the colour of his cornflakes. So Tim come over to get some PlayStation 1 games from me and I happened to be playing Wave Race and he said, oh, what's that? I've never seen that before. I said, that's a brand new Nintendo 64. I've only got the Japanese version. I said, would you like to buy one? I looked after him, of course, family friend. He bought it with Mario and Wave Race. He loved the system so much, he told someone who knew someone who worked at Nintendo, but there was a positive outcome. Because he had it before the Australian release and because he loved the Nintendo 64 so much and because he was a celebrity, Nintendo asked him to do the commercial, and yes, he was in three or four commercials. Power up, speed, bam. I can be here, or I can be here. I can be up, or I can be down. Or I can be over there. Impossible is just not in my dictionary. So after six months of running the business from home, I was making an absolute fortune. I would give my mum a bit of money because, hey, I'm using her house. I'd be buying cards left, right and centre. So I'd buy a Celica, then I'd trade it in, then buy an MR2, then trade it in, then I'd buy an 88 Honda Prelude, trade it in. Now I really wanted the 1995 Honda Prelude, but it was kind of too much to outlay at the time. I wanted to build the business up and get my stock up, and I was buying Sega Saturn games all the time. My collection was massive at this time. Keep in mind, Saturn was only out for two years and already had about 500 games all original, I would obviously keep the original games for myself, and I had heaps. My PlayStation 1 library started growing then as well, and the Japanese N64, I think like I had 80 games in the first year. So then I started to dive into different things. Not only would I get N64, PlayStation, and Saturn, I would start to get 3DO and Jaguar, even Philips CDI. Now, it would only bring one in at a time. I had to be kind of careful. If someone wanted it, they could buy it straight off me. If they didn't, I always had it for myself because one day I wanted to get this massive collection. Because I was making so much money, I could only put so much back into the business and I could only buy so many games. But the rest of the money was getting scary. So I had to get my grandfather to open up an account for me at the bank that I just would not touch. No matter how desperate I got, I just wouldn't touch it. Yep, I definitely knew this was the time to start collecting video games. I'd have almost the full set of Mega Drive games at this stage. I was buying so many Super Nintendo games at cheap prices out of America. This way I knew I'd get the full Super Nintendo library. So I was out doing deliveries and I come home and my mother looked white and she said, you need to sit down. There was this anti-piracy detective that came to the house and he could actually get a warrant to search our house. He just said to my mum, I'm going to give you a subtle warning, tell Joel to stop selling copied games, even if they're not burnt, being pressed and copied from Hong Kong. So he obviously knew, maybe they had someone that came to my house and bought off me just like Nintendo did um, back in my shop days. And I said to my mum, that's it, I'm stopping. I'm making so much money on mods and even selling consoles. And I was selling original software for the Saturn and PlayStation. Obviously not as much as saying selling a burnt $15 disc, you know, from Hong Kong, a, a press $15 disc, that's how much they were. No one was going to shell out, you know, $50 to $60 for a brand new original game when they could have a $15 game. So I decided I have to stop that side of the business but there was others who were just selling it so much they didn't stop. Now, I don't know exactly what happened to them. Some of them got caught and prosecuted, but that's their own story. I stopped and didn't want any part of it. I wanted a legitimate business where I could import things from Hong Kong, even one day America, Japan, and sell games without being hassled. And this time, Nintendo and Sega couldn't touch me because I found out the laws of parallel importing was okay to do. Well, in conclusion, I was bringing in so much money I could almost start looking at putting a deposit on a house. But I thought I'd hold off a little bit longer and get my dream car, the 1995 Honda Prelude VTIR. So I decided to finally go out, take out a little bit of finance because I didn't have all the money and I wanted to keep money in my business and keep that afloat. And I was on cloud nine. My life was literally perfect.